emphasizing things like um, Sam Wilkinson's work, oh, it's about levels of trust in a society, or Putnam's work about social capital, somehow um, inequality reduces social capital, particularly among the poorest. Um, and I think those are valuable approaches along with the social network models. Um, but recently I've been more concerned with how you can take sort of micro perspective on um, bioculture perspective from anthropology. And you can use that to shed light on these more macro processes. Um, so it doesn't just get reduced to either, oh, the brain or social capital or social networks or some sort of cause. And I think uh, through a lens like neuroanthropology, which I've spent the uh, past few years developing colleagues um, based on previous work, then you have uh, a different lens on you know, what are some of the drivers of mental and behavioral health, what are some of the drivers of non-communicable chronic diseases, as well as how those link with uh, inequality. And that's really one of my areas of research going forward, is to lay out the groundwork for people to do that kind of work. Medical model of deafness is, is definitely, definitely predominates in, in Mexico. And so under this medical model, deafness is seen as something that um, needs to be uh, cured and or rehabilitated. So the, so the primary kind of focus of this medicalized model are medical interventions and or speech therapy or oralization. And oralization focuses on the um, deaf child reproducing aspects of the dominant spoken or, and written language, which of course in Mexico is Spanish. Um, and I say reproducing that language because it's really difficult for deaf individuals who can't fully access the audible sounds of a spoken language to really learn that language in, in, its, in its entirety. And this is something that came up with my participants quite often. So the medical model is not an educational model, and education is not the focus. Training and rehabilitating are the focus. Um, because these language, this language therapy is more like training than, than learning a language. I think, I think this is a problem shared by, uh, by chronic non-communicable diseases, uh, which often rely on prevention, physical activity, these sorts of approaches. One of the things you see in the literature on this subject is that exercise affects the brain differently depending on which stage of addiction, uh, which drug was used, and uh, which exercise you're using. And so one of the things we'd like to do is sort of come up with a, a matrix that identifies, uh, you know, this exercise goes with this stage of addiction with this drug, and then sort of help uh, clinicians tailor an exercise regime uh, to the individual. In that, even in small pilot studies or in experimental approaches, that's something that draws on. The logical approach um, yields equal benefits or perhaps with less side effects, like the drugs, or lower cost, whatever it may be, less consequences in terms of negative outcomes, but that's I think, one of the keys that I'm, I'm interested in. Um, but I think there's a broad range to point to uh, that these things are cropping up everywhere. And um, we don't have good models for how you develop those sorts of things. The thing that I'm interested in is looking at um, exercise and use as a clinical intervention in substance addicted populations. Uh, we know from the literature that substance abuse causes degradation uh, in specific areas of the brain. And we also know that exercise uh, can actually uh, increase what's called plasticity, which is the brain's uh, ability to form new connections and learn. Thing that was clear as these young men and women struggled with addiction was um, this model of treatment, um, the, the therapeutic community certainly offered them a social space outside their normal lives. And, um, and in that sense, they did really well in that space. Um, a lot of the problems came when they had to go back to, uh, to their regular lives or their old lives, which was often said. And there, the boys and girls were caught um, between institutional structures and demands, um, which 
which were coming through a much more uh, bureaucratic model of development um, that had long served people not like these kids from the very poor background margins of the world, um, as well as the loss of a lot of their traditional networks. I work with a group of undocumented Latino immigrants living in Atlanta, Georgia. Some members of the group I work with seek health care at small, informal, and often hidden health care settings that may overcharge for the services they provide and don't always provide adequate health care. Despite receiving substandard care from these smaller hidden clinics, many of the undocumented immigrants I work with prefer to find services there instead of going to larger, more formal health care settings like hospitals because they're afraid of having their immigration status discovered. Laws that have recently passed in Georgia and several national laws make the community I work with afraid of having their immigration status discovered, which impacts how they seek health care. This scenario points to a need to develop a kind of health care service that not only meets the needs of undocumented Latinos living in Atlanta, but can also exist outside of the realm of fear of de being deported. In Southern Belize, there are a fairly wide range of options for people when they are in need of health services. Um, there's a national health care system in Belize and in the rural south where poverty rates are high, those state services are free or extremely low cost. Um, for those that have some income, there are a few private doctors and pharmacies remain widely used. And traditional and home remedies are also fairly common um, in households throughout the, the town and district. When we look at health and healthcare in developing countries, um, one of the things that I want to highlight is the big shift um, to chronic non-communicable diseases as well as the impact of behavioral mental health um, as development proceeds. And those things are, are more my areas of expertise. We also have problems with HIV AIDS and lots of other infectious diseases, emerging diseases, new diseases. But in terms of what I work on, um, we just recognize that these uh, chronic non communicable diseases, as well as mental behavior health, are having a huge, huge disease burden, not just in countries like the United States, but that as we move move to recognizing inequality, um, it doesn't just get framed as being about poverty. Um, the state system in Southern Belize is not very well regarded. Uh, services are lacking. There are no specialists, no specialist care. Um, simply general care, general medicine is available. No surgeries. So many people with anything serious have to get transferred outside the district. Um, a minimum of a two to three hour bus ride, ambulance ride, car ride, um, up to four to five hours to get to the major hospitals in the north of the country. Um, so despite being free or low cost, state services are limited and have a fairly poor reputation amongst community members. When I first began my research in 2009 in the Mopan Maya village of Santa Cruz in the Toledo district of Belize, um, a health clinic had recently opened in the neighboring village of San Antonio, about four miles away from Santa Cruz. Prior to the opening of this health clinic, community members desiring hospital or clinic care needed to make the approximately two-hour journey on an unreliable bus, on an unreliable road, um, to get to the town of Punta Gorda to receive hospital or clinic care. As you might imagine, this um, clinic being new and being close by um, provided um, a lot of talking points um, around the subject of health during the time um, of my research in Santa Cruz. Many people would talk about going to the clinic. They would ask um, me for rides to reach the clinic um, in the truck that my project provided. Um, they would discuss health um, in terms of what they had learned at the clinic, 
or what they had discovered there. That's not to mean that they abandoned other health practices. Um, other health practices um, continued um, throughout the course of my research. Um, the use of bush doctors or traditional um, practitioners, health practitioners, continued the use of midwives um, and the traveling across the border to Guatemala um, to access health care there, either in clinical settings or in um, traditional um, healing settings with traditional healers also occurred um, very frequently. But there's two points that I would like to address um, in relation to the new health clinic that opened four miles away. The first issue is that in many conversations that I had um, with friends um, and their families, and um, a lot of these conversations were with young mothers um, who had taken their babies to the health clinic. And if the baby was sick or um, they wanted to access wellness services for their baby, oftentimes they would take their baby to the clinic. When I would say, okay, what was wrong with the baby? What happened at the clinic? Um, I would say the majority of the responses that I got were that um, the babies were given an injection. Um, sometimes they were given medicine. And um, the majority of the time, the mothers um, had um, no understanding of what the injection was for and no understanding of what the medication was for. And for me, this was troublesome. And this needn't necessarily be troublesome because I believe that um, traditional healers and bush doctors often use um, plants and methods that are not um, common knowledge to the folks receiving um, the health care. Um, but for me, it was problematic in terms of um, the lack of communication between the practitioner um, and the um, client at the clinic. So it seemed through the course of my study that the, there was a power, a power um, differential um, in terms of education, in terms of um, language. Oftentimes the practitioners at the clinic um, did not speak even English. Sometimes um, they were trying to communicate with Mopan Maya speakers um, who often had English as their second language, um, English being the language um, spoken in Belize, um, who were trying to communicate with these people in Spanish. Um, so some of, um, some of the community members spoke a little bit of Spanish, but um, very few. So their language barrier combined with um, the barrier of education and information about the services being offered and the medications and um, being dispensed um, seemed to be problematic in and of itself, with patients often um, talking about how they were dissatisfied and they were um, confused about the treatments that were being offered. The hospital has done amazing work in extent extending the life expectancy of the local populations and the infant mortality rates have been drastically reduced both for the Batwa and the Bachiga. There's an organization that is runs parallel to the hospital called the Batwa Development Project. Uh, again, it is religiously based and primarily funded from the, the church through the Church of Uganda and uh, the parish or the um, a church in in Texas. The, I had the opportunity to volunteer with the, the hospital and I learned more about the Batwa Development Program and it really had the best intentions and it was doing a lot of good for the local communities as far as public health uh, markers and indicators. However, they definitely saw the Batwa as as someone to be acted upon rather than equal partners in the development process. And um, I wouldn't say that they were considered fully adult. The, the organization had purchased land and built homes for the Batwa. So they have a place to live in the sedentary sense, but there's been little, very little work to 
to try to regain their access to the forest. And they, they have found funding to send the children to schools, uh, but they're boarding schools and they're separate, you know, the children are completely separated from their heritage. And that's not seen as a problem. Uh, they basically see that they, they expect that the Batua need to be assimilated into modern society and still do not have any uh, real appreciation for how the Batua may have lived and what what being expelled from the forest or putting them on reservations, which is essentially where they're living now, might impact the, their health. When I spoke to the Batwa, they used to, to have a wide variety of foods that they ate in the forest, usually over 20 items. And when I spoke to them, they were primarily eating about four different items, mainly starches. So even though their life expectancy had been expanded, um, the, the quality of their life was, was questionable. That leaves private doctors, most of whom are a part of that state healthcare system. Uh, they were either at one time employed by the state and worked in the state hospital and clinic, or currently are employed and simply have private practice hours outside of their work at the state facilities. Um, people have mixed opinions on these folks, but generally seem to think they get better care at the private practice um, as opposed to going to the state clinic or hospital. Um, traditional, medicine, traditional medicine is still widely used. There are a number of traditional healers in town and in the surrounding villages um, Maya, of Maya descent, of Garifuna descent, and of Creole descent. Um, these traditional healers range in ability and effectiveness. Um, and not everybody is into the idea of using traditional healers. Most people will at least turn to them in a time of need. If the clinic practice, clinic medicine doesn't work, the hospital medicine doesn't work, pharmacy can't seem to fix what's going on, people will turn to traditional medicine. Some people tr turn to traditional medicine right away. Um, why varies across the community. Um, most households also practice some form of traditional home remedy. Um, the rural nature of the district has led to the uh, need for home remedies to persist and be, and they are widely used. Um, Over my time there, I wanted to try to tease out how people decide what services to use. Why do they use traditional practices over the state health care? Why do they go to the clinic? Why do they go to the private doctor? What factors drive these decisions? And in the end, I think basically most people want to just be healthy. When they get sick, they want to be better. And there are common financial and social and family factors involved, but generally my experience, my research showed that people will do whatever it takes to get healthy again. The second point I would like to make um, came out through um, extended conversations with the um, government trained midwife who was a resident um, in the village of Santa Cruz. Through conversations with her, um, it came to pass that she was telling me that she very rarely still delivered babies um, in the village of Santa Cruz, even though the official word from the clinic was that she was um, trained and capable to deliver um, the second through the sixth child, with the first and the seventh and every subsequent child. Um, the recommendation would be for the birthing mother to go to the clinic. When, when I asked her why she rarely delivered um, these second through sixth children, um, as was the norm um, for much of the previous um, um, history of, of how births were conducted um, in Maya villages, she said that she was afraid if something happened to the baby that she would get sued. 
this was an interesting comment and one that um, she reiterated many times. Um, it seemed like a very, um, something that I would hear um, in the States, not something that I was used to hearing um, in the village of Belize, this idea that there would be a lawsuit brought against her if she attended a birth in the village and there was a problem with that birth. Um, I would speculate that this, this rhetoric or this um, explanation that she gave um, was she'd learned through, um, as part of her trainings, um, her sponsored trainings at the clinic. Um, and for me, it was uh, problematic um, in many senses. So there were mothers that um, desired to give birth in a traditional way with their families or local birth attendants um, attending the birth in their homes. But these mothers were um, often told um, at their clinic visits that they should go to the clinic or go to the hospital to give birth. And I actually witnessed this happening many times um, with increasing frequency even over the four years um, in which I have um, been conducting research. And so, what healthcare is preferred varies really not only just by household, but by health event. Um, like I said, people want to be healthy, so they choose what they think is the most effective, depending on their financial situation, the actual health problem, what has worked in the past for those health problems, and what's working now. So if one thing isn't working, people turn to another. So it can increase plasticity and the areas associated with memory and learning. And so what we want to do is try to see if can you use this to um, help the brain heal itself uh, after the damage done by uh, drug addiction.